Hello, everyone, and welcome to this writing lesson. In this unit, we are going to talk about process paragraphs. In a process paragraph, you explain how to make or do something. So process paragraphs are also called how-to paragraphs. To explain how to do something clearly, break the process down into a series of steps and explain each step. This paragraph explains the process of building a campfire. As we read it together, count the number of steps. Also notice the words and phrases that introduce each step. Let's read it together. How to build a one-match campfire. Building a campfire that you can light with one match is simple if you follow these steps. The first step is to prepare a safe place for your campfire. Clear an area on the ground at least three feet wide and put a circle of stones around it. Second, gather fuel. You will need several sizes of fuel, small twigs, medium sticks, and large sticks. The next step is to build a teepee. Put a handful of twigs in a small pile and use the small sticks to build a small teepee over the pile. Leave spaces large enough to drop a lighted match through. Next, build a cabin around the teepee using the medium sticks. Fifth, place two large pieces of wood on either side of the cabin and lay two or three long sticks on top to make a loose roof. The last step is to light a match and drop it through a space in the teepee. Soon you will enjoy the warmth of a nice fire and your friends will admire your skill at lighting a campfire with only one match. So what do you think the topic sentence is? That's right, building a campfire that you can light with one match is simple if you follow these easy steps, is the topic sentence. What words show that the paragraph will explain a process? Follow these steps. How many steps were there? Do you remember? That's right, six steps. And does the concluding sentence summarize the steps, or does it restate the topic sentence in different words? Once again, the concluding sentence is, soon you will enjoy the warmth of a nice fire and your friends will admire your skill at lighting a campfire with only one match. So if you take a look at the topic sentence, you can say that the concluding sentence actually restates the topic sentence in different words. A process paragraph begins with a topic sentence that names the topic and tells the reader to look for a process or procedure. Use words such as steps, procedure, directions, suggestions, and instructions. Take a look at these topic sentences. You can teach your dog to fetch in a very short time by following this procedure. Making a pizza is easy if you follow these instructions. Follow these steps to throw a frisbee accurately. The supporting sentences are the steps and details about each step. For example, when your dog brings back the stick, praise him extravagantly. The first step is to gather the ingredients you will need. First, grip the edge of the frisbee with all your fingers wrapped underneath the edge and your thumb along the top. And the concluding sentence can be the last step, or it can give the results, like this. At the end of the lesson, give your dog a nice treat for a job well done. Now sit down and enjoy your delicious pizza. Finally, make sure the frisbee stays level while you throw. Now let's take a look at some time order signals. In a process paragraph, you arrange the steps in order by time and use time order signals to guide your reader from step to step. 
Here's a list of some time order signals. Please pause your video, take a look at this chart, and then play the video again. Now let's make some sentences about the process of cooking a pizza using these connectors. Numbers 4, 5, and 6 here in the chart are time clauses that we are going to use in our sentences. So let's make these sentences. First, preheat the oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, prepare the pizza sauce. The next step is to mix the pizza dough. After five minutes, check the pizza. After you take the pizza out of the oven, cut it into eight pieces. Before throwing the frisbee, make sure it is level. And finally, when your dog brings the stick back, reward him with a treat. A very important rule now, parallelism. You have already studied sentence variety, and now you may be afraid of writing sentences that repeat simple patterns. Don't be. Some ideas work best in sentences that clearly show a pattern. When you analyze an idea, it may take you time to discover similarities and differences among its parts. Whether you intend to compare or contrast those elements, you want readers to see how the parts are alike or different. Parallelism is the key. The principle of parallel construction is simple. Be sure the ideas that are similar in content and function look the same. Parallelism works because the similarity of the appearance of the items clearly shows the pattern of the thought. The principle of parallelism applies most often to the following. Two or more items in a series, usually with a coordinating conjunction, and I will talk about this in detail, and when you have a pair of items with correlative conjunctions. Let's talk about the items in a series first. The principle of parallelism requires that all items in a series must be grammatically alike. That is, all words in a series must be the same type of word, all phrases the same type of phrase, and all clauses the same type of clause. Grammatical likeness also applies to sentences in a series. Each item in the series must be a complete sentence, not a fragment, and therefore the same type of sentence. However, the structures within these complete sentences can vary, so the patterns within the sentences may appear somewhat different. How do we use the coordinating conjunctions with a series? When you have two or more items in a series, within a single sentence, you should normally use a coordinating conjunction, which we are going to call CC before the final item. The coordinating conjunctions, or CCs, are, as you know, and, but, nor, for, so, or, yet. So the series looks like this, item, CC, item. Look at the example. I saw John and Mary. The series also could look like this. Item, item, CC item. Look at the example now. I saw John, Bill, and Mary. Let's look at phrases in series now. I see him going to work and coming home. The phrases are going to work plus coming home. Both are ING phrases and have the same function, so they are parallel. And of course, you have the coordinating conjunction AND connecting the two phrases. I plan to eat in a restaurant and to see a movie. Again, you can see two, two phrases connected with AND. Let's look at dependent clauses in series now. The phone rang when I reached the motel, but before I unpacked my suitcases.
And here's an example of independent clauses in series. I liked the parrot, so I bought it for my mother. And finally, a look at complete sentences in series. She sold the car for three good reasons. It had no tires, it had no brakes, it had no engine. Notice that each item being a word, phrase, clause, or sentence in a series has the same form as the other items in the same series. Remember, use commas and semicolons with items in a series. Commas and sometimes semicolons mark the division of items in a series within a sentence. Commas are the most common dividers. Look at this example from the previous unit. The ethics of contemporary surgery are often a problem for the patient, the doctor, and the patient's family. When commas occur within one or more of items in a series, semicolons mark the divisions between the items. Again, here's an example I used in the previous unit. Key European air routes include stops in Lisbon, Portugal, Rome, Italy, Frankfurt, Germany, and Istanbul, Turkey. The words in a series of words seldom present special problems. However, the articles that appear with the series can create a minor parallelism problem. Articles are a, an, and the. When articles appear with words in a series, be sure the articles fall in one of these two patterns. Article, word, word, cc, word, or article, word, article, word, cc, article, word. Let's look at a few examples. First, a look at an incorrect example. I bought food for the dog, cat, and the horse. Now, to correct this, you just need to omit the article, the last article, like in the model. I bought food for the dog, cat, and horse. Or you could write this example by adding the article to all three items. Like, I bought food for the dog, the cat, and the horse. As you can see, the correct sentences have either an article before the entire series, or an article before every item in the series. Unlike words in a series, phrases often cause problems. Many times, students mix type of phrases. Be sure that ING phrases fit with other ING phrases, two phrases with two phrases, and so forth. Look at this example and see if it's correct. Are the phrases used all the same form? I like swimming in the pond, cycling down the lane, and to ride horses in the pasture. This is an incorrect example, because this phrase is different from the other two phrases. The correct form would look like this. I like swimming in the pond, cycling down the lane, and riding horses in the pasture. Or here is another correct form. I like to swim in the pond, to cycle down the lane, and to ride horses in the pasture. Let's correct another sentence together. I plan to study hard, doing well on my exams, and to graduate with honors. How would you correct this sentence? That's right. I plan to study hard, to do well on my exams, and to graduate with honors. As you know, you could also use the ING form and write it like this. I plan on studying hard, doing well on my exams, and graduating with honors. Clauses in a series seldom cause major problems. However, if the series contains dependent clauses, you can help your readers by signaling the beginning of each dependent clause. Consider this sentence. I expect to be entertained if I am going to pay $9 to get in a theater and I am going to sit there for two hours. 
What does the and join? Does it join the two independent clauses? Or does it join two dependent clauses? That's right. The and joins two dependent clauses. Readers will see the separation of the items more easily if the writer repeats the word that signals the beginning of the clauses. The word that should be repeated is if. Look at the corrected version. I expect to be entertained if I'm going to pay $9 to get in a theater and if I'm going to sit there for two hours. Now the meaning is clear. Here's another sample. I can see that you don't like the meal and that you'd rather not be here, she shouted. Notice that the repetition of that, which signals the beginning of dependent clause, makes the parallel construction clear. In addition to having like words, like phrases, and like clauses in a series within a sentence, be sure that the items in this series are the same type of grammatical unit. Do not, for instance, mix phrases and clauses in a series, like in this example. My roommate likes to sleep in bed, and when he's in class. This sentence is awkward because the writer has joined a phrase in bed with a clause when he's in class. Here's what the writer should have written. My roommate likes to sleep when he's in bed and when he's in class. Now, a clause fits with a clause. Notice that the sentence repeats when the word that signals the beginning of each dependent clause. In the earlier sample of full sentences in a series, all of the sentences are quite short and their internal structures are exactly alike. For example, it had no tires, it had no brakes, it had no engine. Clearly, this is a technique you have to apply sparingly. This type of series could provide a punchy variation if it were mixed in with longer sentences. Too much of it, though, could create the type of choppy, repetitive writing you have learned to avoid. However, complete sentences in a series don't have to be so much alike. Here's another sample this time with some variation within the sentence. My great-grandfather wrote that Abraham Lincoln's appearance at the meeting was striking. Lincoln's beard was short and neatly trimmed. His suit was of a dark cloth that gave him a somber but dignified air. In his hand, he loosely held a black stovepipe hat. These sentences are of varied lengths, 7, 15, and 10 words. Obviously, their internal structures are not exactly alike. Are they parallel? Well, yes, they are. In the simplest sense, they have grammatical similarity, as each is a complete sentence. More important, each provides the same type of information, a quick, descriptive example that answers the same question of how was Lincoln's appearance striking? And even though the sentence structures are not exactly alike, their basic idea patterns are similar. His beard was so-and-so, his suit was so-and-so, his hand held so-and-so. Now let's talk about pairs of items with correlative conjunctions. Correlative conjunctions mate pairs of related items. The rule for parallelism with correlative conjunctions is simple. The grammatical units following each of the correlative conjunctions must be alike. Common correlative conjunctions are these. Either, or, neither, nor, not only, but also, and whether, or. Items mated by correlative conjunctions, which we will call core C, will look like this. Core C item, core C item. Now, here are sentences with such pairs. 
I don't like either his appearance or his manners. Neither my aunt nor my cousin will speak to me. Now, here's a tricky question. Look at this example and see if it is correct. Either I go to bed early or get up late. What do you think? Is there a problem with the sentence? Yes, there is. The sentence demonstrates the most common failure to maintain parallelism with correlative conjunctions. Either precedes the subject of the sentence, I, but or precedes the second verb, get. You have two options for dealing with the problem. You can either change it this way and write, I either go to bed early or get up late. Or you can write it like this, either I go to bed early or I get up late. The first solution moves either, so that both correlative conjunctions precede the verbs go and get. The second solution places either and or before subjects of clauses, I and I. In both corrections, the grammatical units following each correlative conjunction are alike. All of this may seem complicated, but it's not. You wouldn't try to compare apples and buildings because they are not alike. Similarly, you can't expect your readers to accept a comparison of items that appear dissimilar. The principle of parallelism requires only that you make like items look alike so readers can see the similarity. What is a modifier? Modifiers are words, phrases, or clauses that limit or provide additional information about other words. In, I never saw a purple cow, the modifier purple limits the discussion from all cows to only purple cows. Modifiers that limit the definition of other words are called restrictive modifiers. In this sentence, standing on the bridge, the captain watched his ship move slowly through the channel. The modifier standing on the bridge provides additional information about the captain, but it in no way limits the definition. Modifiers that provide information but do not limit definition are called non-restrictive modifiers. In this part, we are going to focus on the placement of modifiers within a sentence. Because placement problems can occur with both types of modifiers, restrictive and non-restrictive, we do not distinguish between them. However, if you look at the examples carefully, you'll see that the most common problems are with placing non-restrictive modifiers. Why? Because a non-restrictive modifier is less essential to the point of the sentence. A writer is less likely to notice that the modifier is misplaced. As you know, modifiers allow you to combine several ideas into one sentence. You might write, Jonathan ate the donut. It was the only donut. However, you save time and space by reducing the second sentence to a modifier and write, Jonathan ate the only donut. Still, there's a catch. Word order in an English sentence often determines meaning. Therefore, different word arrangements may have different meanings. Let's see what happens if we place only in every possible position in Jonathan ate the donut. Look at these examples. Only Jonathan ate the donut. No one else ate it. Jonathan only ate the donut. He didn't do anything else to it. Jonathan ate only the donut. He ate nothing else. Jonathan ate the only donut. There were no other donuts. And Jonathan ate the donut only. He ate nothing else. Five combinations give you four distinctly different meanings. 
Play this game with other sentences and such words as almost, every, just, merely, most, nearly, only, primarily, and principally. The game's implication is obvious, isn't it? Unless you carefully place the modifiers in your sentences, you may not write what you really mean. Modifiers are terrific savers of time and space in your writing, but they also can obscure or distort your meaning, sometimes making your writing appear ridiculous. Placing a modifier in a sentence requires good judgment and careful editing. No particular place in a sentence is always right for a modifier, but this much is true. A modifier tends to modify what it is close to. Close to may be before or after the thing modified, so long as the sentence makes sense. Let's look at some examples where the modifiers are not placed properly. These sentences make little sense. A jeep ran over the soldier that had muddy tires. People stared in amazement on the sidewalk. The accident left neatly pressed tire marks on the soldier's shirt. In these sentences, something comes between the modifiers and the things modified. As a result, the modifiers appear to refer to the things they are closest to. That had muddy tires seem to modify soldier. On the sidewalk seems to refer to amazement. And neatly pressed appears to modify tire marks. Let's correct and move the modifiers so they modify what they should. These sentences make sense. A jeep that had muddy tires ran over the soldier. On the sidewalk, people stared in amazement. Or people on the sidewalk stared in amazement. The accident left tire marks on the soldier's neatly pressed shirt. Notice that on the sidewalk works before or after people, whereas that had muddy tires works only after jeep. And neatly pressed works only before shirt. What matters then is that the modifier must be close enough to the thing it modifies to complete the thought logically. A second type of placement problem occurs when you write strings of modifiers. Consider this example. A man with red hair in a green suit crossed the street. Both with red hair and in a green suit should modify man. But instead, in a green suit seems to refer to hair. One solution is to put the modifier before and another after the thing modified, like this. A red-haired man in a green suit crossed the street. Or, wearing a green suit, a man with red hair crossed the street. A second solution is to combine the modifiers with a coordinating conjunction. A man with red hair and a green suit crossed the street. Again, the exact position of the modifier doesn't matter if the result makes sense. What are dangling modifiers? First of all, dangling means hanging or swinging loosely. Dangling modifiers can occur anywhere in a sentence, but the most common problem is at the beginning. A modifier that begins a sentence must refer to something that follows. Because of convention, readers expect an introductory word or phrase modifier to refer to the subject of the sentence. Look at the example. Walking along the beach, Mary found a sand dollar. Because we expect the opening phrase, walking along the beach, to modify the subject of the sentence, Mary, we know that Mary, not the sand dollar, was walking along the beach. But what if the sentence reads this way? Walking along the beach, a sand dollar was found by Mary. 
Again, we expect the introductory phrase to modify the subject of the sentence. But sand dollars don't walk. Because the modifier cannot logically modify the subject of the sentence, we say that the modifier dangles. Let's look at some other examples of dangling modifiers. Enthusiastic, the hour seemed to pass quickly. Finishing the game, the crowd loudly booed the home team. After examining the data, the steam engine appeared to be the best choice. To enjoy surfing, the waves must be high. And when only nine, John's mother took him to a circus. Was the hour enthusiastic? Did the crowd actually finish the game? Did the steam engine examine the data? Can waves enjoy surfing? Do you really believe that John had a mother who was only nine years old? Because the modifiers here have no logical connection to the subjects of the sentences, we say the modifiers dangle. Now, you have two options to correct dangling modifiers. The first, the most obvious, is to recast the sentence so the subject matches the modifier. Look at the examples that have been corrected this way. Enthusiastic, we thought the hour passed quickly. Finishing the game, the home team heard loud booing from the crowd. After examining the data, we concluded that the steam engine was the best choice. To enjoy surfing, you need high waves. And when only nine, John went to the circus with his mother. The second method is to change the word or phrase modifier into a clause. Look at the corrections using the second method. Because we were enthusiastic, the hour seemed to pass quickly. As the game ended, the crowd loudly booed the home team. After we examined the data, the steam engine appeared to be the best choice. If you want to enjoy surfing, the waves must be high. And when John was only nine, his mother took him to a circus.